with a quotation from Barbara Hepworth from her book, Carvings and Drawings, published in 1952. Quote, from the sculptor's point of view, one can either be the spectator of the object or the object itself. For a few years, I became the object. I was the figure in the landscape and every sculpture contained to a greater or lesser degree, the ever-changing forms and contours embodying my own response to a given position in that landscape. This transmutation of essential unity with land and seascape, which derives from all the sensibilities, was for me a voyage of exploration. There is no landscape without the human figure. It is impossible for me to contemplate prehistory in the abstract. Without the relationship of man and his land, the mental image becomes a nightmare. A sculpture might, and sculptures do, reside in emptiness, but nothing happens until the living human encounters the image." End quote. What does it mean for anyone, but a sculptor specifically, to become an object? What has to take place for that person to make the transition from the role of the seer to the thing seen, the maker to the thing made? Hepworth not only describes herself as the figure in the landscape, but the sculpture as a landscape, a psychic topography as much as a physical environment. The human figure constitutes the landscape in the very opposition her upright posture poses to the horizon of land and seascape, a relation of intersection that forms an essential unity that serves as the true ground for the unending variety of sensation. There is a parallel here between the void of the mind and the emptiness of space. Both demand the mediation of the body for the nightmare of isolation to yield what Hepworth would describe as the magic of encounter. The Swiss German art historian and literary critic Carola Gideon Velker introduced the first lines of Hepworth's statement in her revised and expanded survey of modern sculpture, published in 1955 in German by Gerd Hatje as Plastique des 20. Jahrhunderts, Volumen und Raumgestaltung, and in English by George Wittenborn as Contemporary Sculpture and Evolution in Volume and Space. She surrounded these words, which are down here, with two photographs of Hepworth's wood carving, Pandur, from 1947, set on two wooden planks that could swivel on a pedestal, just visible along the bottom edge of each image. The sculpture has been set up outdoors against the dark foliage of a hedge, beyond which we can see the sea, the horizon, and the sky. Judging by the landscape, the angle of the camera has not changed from one photograph to the next, but rather the position of the sculpture relative to the camera and to the sea. We can imagine that Hepworth, or her photographer, if it wasn't her herself, began by positioning Pandur as it appears in the image on the lower left of the spread uh, pictured prior. Pedestal, planks, and sculpture all flush with the picture plane. Grabbing the planks, she might have spun the sculpture around to show us its once dorsal side, overshooting the mark so that the work now appears oblique to the photographic frame and the pedestal alike. What this view allows us to see is a void at right here that perfectly frames the sky above the horizon beyond, an aperture that would surely have remained obscured had the work remained square to the camera. Indeed, Alex Potts would use just such an alternate view of Pendur to make the argument that, quote, the interruptions created by those cavities on the far side, breaking into the simply rounded overall form of the sculpture, cannot be inferred from the slight irregularities in the shaping of the sculpture's outer surfaces on the near side, end quote. Indeed, for Potts, it was essential to make this point through two views of the sculpture that had a precise 180 degree relationship to each other in space, since his aim was to show how Hepworth's sculptures refused the spatial order of relief and the stability of a, quote, standard point of view that it provides. For the sculptor theorist Adolf Hildebrand, writing in the 19th century, this standard point of view, or Normalansicht, was precisely what anchored the body of the sculpture and the spectator alike in the void of space. 
Encoded within plastic form and independent of the temporality of experience, this Normalansicht was precisely what Heinrich Wolfling, following Hildebrand, demanded the photograph ought to reproduce. Potts uses the repetition of just such a normal ansicht to make us see that Hepworth's sculptures, by contrast, quote, are not so much plastic shapes as objects that take on a very different character when seen from various angles, end quote. Yet in Hepworth's own volume of sculpture records from 1947, the photographic pairing we find is not the one Potts would later enlist, but the one chosen by Gideon Velker herself. Looking through Hepworth's volumes of sculpture records, we have ample opportunity to consider what role the photograph might play in the metamorphosis of creative subjectivity into a state of becoming an object. Staying with Pendor for the moment, we find another pairing on the facing page in this record book, again taking from opposing sides of the sculpture, now set against different surroundings. Whereas the pair at right emphasizes the way the sculpture becomes a viewing apparatus that catches the landscape in its very form. This pair shows us how the contrasting tonality of the background variously colors the work itself, overcoming by analogy, the limitation of the grayscale image to register the honeyed wood with its blue and white painted cavities. For with every photograph of a sculpture, we must not only consider how the object takes form through the image, how photography, in other words, becomes another sculptural technique akin to carving or modeling. We must also recognize that the photographic image objectifies or makes tangible a particular perception or sensibility, as Hepworth put it. As such, it refuses to conform to an ideal point of view that would structure experience in its wake, but rather serves as a record of the temporality of perception, a form as it coalesces in time in tandem with the beholding body. Here I want to return to one last phrase in Hepworth's statement quoted earlier, that is, quote, there is no landscape without the human figure. It is impossible for me to contemplate prehistory in the abstract, end quote. The allusion to prehistory here operates on two registers. First, it recalls the meniers, dolmen, and other megalithic structures that punctuate the landscape where Hepworth lived and worked. These were primary forms that preoccupied Gideon Velker too. On a trip to Britain in August, 1935, she traveled to Cornwall where she photographed the Menalt Hole stone group, local life in St. Ives and the dramatic cliffs along the far Western coastline. That summer, she also visited Stonehenge with Walter and Isa Gropius who introduced her to Hepworth. And Hepworth, in turn, would subsequently include Gideon Velker's photographs from Stonehenge at the end of her essay, Sculpture, published in the 1937 anthology Circle, International Survey of Constructive Art, which you see here on the left. Inspired by her close exchange with James Joyce, who had urged her to make her first pilgrimage to the Neolithic sites of Brittany, Gideon Velker had come to understand that any history of modern sculpture had to cement its relationship to what she termed a, quote, decisive er form. In her first attempt to grasp this history, published as New Roads in Modern Sculpture in the journal Transition from 1934, she argued that, quote, Modern plastic art wants to reconstitute primal qualities. It wants to go back to the elementary sources in order to form generally valid symbols of time, the world and nature, out from the simple viewpoint." End quote. Modern sculpture was a recursive enterprise, a quote, return to the primal phenomena or ur phenomen of life. That is the fact that, quote, the human body is a plastic reality, just as much as the world of the object surrounding it, end quote. What was at stake, Gideon Velker claimed, is, quote, the extension of our mental and sensual zones of perception. The composition is neither thematically nor aesthetically fixed, rounded out or existence in itself, but is generally liberating and communicative, end quote. Hence, for Gideon Velker, 
Armorican artifacts immediately recalled another prehistory, one that subtends all human experience, serving as the ground for the extension of perception and the body, for a psychic engagement with the world that is not contemplative, but communicative, directed outward. This was the insight that allowed her to recognize a fundamental resonance between the very new and the very old, elemental forms that exist outside of history as a written chronicle of linear time. Rather, Gideon Velker aimed to offer a visual history of art, of the visual history of the art of her time. It was not possible for her to imagine that modern sculpture was the inevitable consequence of all that had come before, the telos toward which history progressively unfolded. Sculpture's ancient claim to embody an epoch or to serve as its symbol was no longer simply given to the historian, intact, to be described, but had to be constructed anew out of the fragments left in the wake of a technologized modernity. She could not follow her teacher Wolfling's commitment to the a priori standard point of view, a conceit that quarantined the figure from space and froze it in time. Like Hepworth, she could not contemplate it in the abstract. How might we understand the photographs they exchanged less as records of the materiality and form of the bodies they depict and rather more as concrete visualizations of the perception of the other? We find the beginning of an answer in Hepworth's response to Gideon Velker's request for photographs of Pandur and other recent work as the historian was updating her watershed visual history of modern sculpture, modern plastic art, Elements of Reality, Volume and Disintegration, which she originally published in 1937. Writing on November 8th, 1952, Hepworth affirmed, quote, your comment that you were interested in my interpretation of the human figure really warmed my heart. You are one of the very few people in the world who really understand the language of sculpture. In the most part, those who now write about sculpture are so busy reading into it values which do not and should not exist in sculpture that they miss altogether the impact which they should be receiving through their senses. One can tell by the gesture and stance of a person approaching a sculpture, whether he understands it or not. I was most interested to watch in my exhibition some of the very young people. They seemed altogether much more alive in their behaviors and responses than those a generation or more older. I am sending some photos with the print you ask for with this letter. Please keep any which you like enough. And um, that's where I'll leave it. And I'm really looking forward to hearing. I feel that there's been so many resonances throughout this whole uh, morning for me, afternoon for you. Um, so I will just turn it over to the discussion. Thank you very much.